Brad Smaler, welcome to Between Two Bears. Oh, appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. We're excited to have you. Uh, been a bit of a busy week for you, Brad. Book came out on Friday, launch party. You know, that was obviously the, the culmination of a lot of hard work and, and emotion. How was it? Oh, it's been huge. Uh, I've been enjoying it, actually. Like, I've, I mean, I this year I haven't been very busy. I've been stuck in bed rest and had a lot going on. Uh, with my health and so now that I'm able to be up in my chair and get out and about and especially with the timing with the book coming out it's just been perfect like book launch was epic like just so many good friends and family around and um, just celebrating something you know like like here in New Zealand we don't really celebrate our successes as much like but it was just like no it was a, a night about celebrating the achievements and really really enjoyed um, all the media throughout the week like it's just you know radio interviews and tv stuff it's just been been really cool and i've um yeah just enjoyed doing stuff getting out and about and kind of having something something going on um after quite a quiet year yeah i've been following your media journey we had ross taylor on a couple of weeks ago and it was like he got wheeled out it was you know hosking and jono and ben and matt and jerry and it's kind of like i've seen you sort of walk the same path is, yeah. is it do you always end up saying the same things like is your story do you, do you ever get sick of telling the same story there's i mean there's some of the same things that come across but i find most interviews there's there's always a slightly different dynamic like um you know and, and it depends on the audience and who's you know who's interviewing and things like that like whether it's like news talk zb versus uh the morning rumble on the rock like they're very different you know listeners and 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 everyone and and they're kind of some are more willing to ask the juicy questions than the others and um so no i've, I've really enjoyed it but it does get a little bit repetitive sometimes so I'll, you know i try to mix things up if i can well well un unwittingly we've pit you head to head with ross taylor we had him on a couple of episodes ago his book's going quite well and i gather early sales on your side you're coming for that number one spot yeah he's sitting in uh, number one i think with um what is it non-fiction so uh yeah we'll see how things are looking next week but no i, I you know enjoy a bit of friendly competition and it's always good to to kind of see how the uh the sales are going awesome. especially against you know a cricketer you know rugby and cricket like as a wakeboarder i always like battled against kind of the idea you know rugby and cricket were the, the only sports you could really make money out of here in new zealand so look if i can knock a cricketer off the top spot i'd be <laughs> you know it'd be a bit of uh I don't know, indirect payback i guess but yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i've read your book uh i just finished it last night loved it um and i gotta say i went into it not knowing your story so it was really good to i, I kind of got the gist of, of what it was yeah but the part that surprised me and i think it was the first message i said to shay holy shit did. there's a lot of sex in yeah this he book. did he definitely he definitely did and then they just kept coming the messages kept coming like there's a lot of sex and, in this book and and i heard you say in in interviews that it's the thing that people want to ask you about but no one really has the balls unless they've had, had a couple of beers yeah. Well, we we got the balls. We want to <laughs> we want to talk bears. sex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Was it? It was obviously a conscious decision to put that much detail in the book. Um, what? Wh how come? What, what yeah. Um, well, it's a story of my life, and I guess that was a big part of my life. You know, and and as a young young man, you know, late teens, early twenties, sex is a big part of our focus, and or well, it was for me, and. Um, you know, I tried having relationships, whether it was long distance and, or, you know, for the time when I was back in New Zealand, in between go back to the States and all the travel. And it just became something where, you know, wakeboarding was kind of the love that took precedent over relationships and everything. I was having to travel so much, so it was so hard to hold down a proper relationship. So there was a certain point, which you may have, found in the book where I just basically said fuck this like I, I just had a breakup you know I, I was trying to make things work and I was like fuck it I'm going to be single I'm going to enjoy it I'm going to you know like try and be um, you know I don't want to be labelled as a player so I was like if I'm honest and if I'm like hey I'm leaving at the end of the season we can either hang out or, or not that's up to you but I'm just putting the cards on the table and so yeah that was just something that i 
I don't know, I wanted to write about because, yeah, a few reasons, as you said, like after my accident, it became something that quite a lot of people are interested in. So I wanted to show the comparison. Um, and as well, you know, there was a lot of emotion and a lot of issues that I ended up kind of struggling with after the accident because of the amount of importance I put on sex. And um, so, yeah, I wanted that comparison. And that's the reason there is like, you know, at least half the book is from before the accident. It's building up the story, getting to know me, getting to know the life I was living so that you could really feel the impact of the crash the way I felt it as opposed, you know, like someone could have the exact same injury as me, but if they were someone who sat behind a desk their entire life, like they're not going to feel it the same way I did with the amount of importance I put on the physical. So whether it's, you know, wakeboarding or activities or, you know, um, I was doing modeling and things like that, you know, body image stuff. Um, or, you know, the, uh, yeah, the kind of the change that um, that came about with uh, with sex and things like that. So yeah, it's it was just something you know, and I had some good stories to tell as well. As you, you did, found, like, you did have some good stories, and the yeah. way that it was written in sort of first person present tense, I was there with you. You know, there was one the the foursome with three sort of very attractive women. Uh, definitely caught my attention. Yeah, uh, you know, it was yeah, it was good when there's such heavy themes to give some light as well yeah and it's um you know even you would have found in the the one of the relationships i had after my accident i completely screwed up because of the programming over the years of like the way i'd lived my life and how i yeah the importance i put on things the belief i had in and you know it, the attention i was getting and what that meant in terms of me feeling good about myself and ego stuff and so yeah I think um, you know I want A I want it to be a juicy fun story for people to read but I also want you know especially young men to read it and once they get to the end to maybe question how much importance they put on it you know the way get, they go about it and um, yeah so it'd be interesting to get some of that feedback when more people have finish reading it because I'm, I'm really enjoying getting like feedback coming through now as people are starting to finish the book it, 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 it's not just young men it's 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 older men as well that are reading <laughs> it and, and reflecting on on the way that they they um the way that they interact and, and the importance that they put on things and I, I do want to while we're throwing bouquets I want to throw another one just the way it's really visceral the way that it's written like the words jump off the page you can feel you can I could anyway genuinely feel your anxiety and your angst and the the things that you grappled with and I think it was really important to put that that front half in to really understand the struggle and the process that you went through at the back end of it it um it really humanizes it and regardless of whether you have an injury or not mm. those thoughts live with people in everyday life for sure um and I was questioning I was like you know obviously the book's not small it's uh, maybe a little daunting to pick up off the shelf in the bookstore and so that was kind of I'm like, have we gone a bit too much with the the whole story from beforehand? But then again, you know, I've read like Andre Agassi's book, Open. I've read Scar Tissue. I've read um, actually not that many books before writing my own one. Um, but I found like Andre Agassi's book, you know, it's it's such a big seller and it's a great book. But it, you know, and it's it's chronological from start to finish the way mine is. But then mine has that turning point. It has the the injury that comes in and the really massive impact that that kind of has. So, yeah, I just felt like, you know, when I came to reading the final version, I was, you know, it was reading really well. And it, yeah, it was almost like taking one of those sort of athlete autobiographies and just adding in the injury element. So it kind of, yeah, I'm, I'm stoked on how it turned out and I'm glad it kind of comes across that way as well. Nice. Um, I want to start sort of painting the picture a little bit. And, and I, I want to start for the audience who have never heard Brad Smadler before, which was yeah. me before I read the book. And I want to give, I want to paint a picture of what an incredibly put together, beautiful, six foot two, wakeboarding, living 10 
back to back to back summers uh, in Florida, you know, your life was, you were a model, you could build, you know, you could do it all. And if you were okay, are you able to just paint a bit of a picture? So, so the accident happened when you were 27 in 2014. Yeah. But leading up to that in the sort of the year before, can you help set a scene of, of what your life was like? Yeah, so I, you know, I'd picked a niche sport, um, which was quite challenging to to make money. And like, if you're winning all the contests, then you can make a decent living. But, um, you know, I'd, I dropped out of school a year early and took off to the States because, you know, Orlando, Florida is the mecca for wakeboarding. And, um and yeah I, was, I had some good results but I wasn't like the top guy that was winning all the events and over the years you know I had some injuries and some ups and downs financial struggles and um, it really just became I don't know it was, it was a, a struggle to earn money in it. And but I was so passionate about it that I was like every, every end of every New Zealand summer back to the States regardless of how much, little amount of money I had a lot of the times I didn't actually have any money saved I was just like cool I paid my credit card off now I can start taking it back up again I was going to ask was it like a hustler's mentality like a proper like I'll just do what I can to live the life that I want to live yeah I mean you know you even seen in my book like I was selling baggies of weed and you know like and even you know doing um, manual labouring I even did a, uh, a topless waitering gig for a, a male stripper friend who I met and like just anything that I could do to earn money um, modeling work was great because it was great money and it was not you know not that difficult <laughs> just turn up um, <laughs> take exactly. your shirt off <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah I was really struggling to actually make a living out of the sport but you know regardless of blonde knees and shoulders and everything else that you know surgeries I had to go through I was back there every US summer um, and pursuing the dream and in 2013 my board sponsor Ronix Wakeboards they bought a property just outside of Florida 210 acres two private lakes and it was like all right team here's your new training facility and but the funny thing was it was for that summer our whole team became manual laborers <laughs> like that was your job as a team member of, of Ronix was to get out to the lake as much as you can and help build it into what it became which we all love to do it and especially me I was all about it because I mean I'd never had a wakeboard boat growing up like we we had like a bay liner for a while and these boats are you know back then were a hundred grand now they're like a quarter of a million dollars to get a one of the boats you need to be able to compete and um, you know so I'd never had that I'd never had the opportunity to just go build what you want we've got like c cable systems and boats and you know you can ride as much as you want but here's here's some budget here's you know go get the materials and build whatever you want so as a team we got together and kind of worked on that but I I made sure I stood out because I was like in my mind I was like they're going to want someone to live here and run the place um, and I kind of decided that before they even put the offer out and got there and just worked my ass off and started building stuff and just kind of took initiative and and I guess I was in a way I was sort of lucky that I had lived the struggle and had to work for everything my whole career because a lot of a lot of wakeboarders you know a lot of them been handed everything I was going to say is it, an, is it an entitled kind of a sport in it's the a, US? Yeah a bit of a rich sport like yeah. you know well with needing that type of boat and to live on a lake well, you don't have to live on a lake, but Florida, you know, mum and dad's got the, the gas card and all they have to worry about is is the actual riding element. Whereas for me, it was like, okay, I need to afford to ride. And as you're saying, the hustler's mentality of getting there. And so I just applied that to this place and just gave them no option. They offered me the job. And, um, and it was funny because then next thing I'm getting paid by this board sponsor that didn't pay me before that. And I'm like, Okay, so I'm being paid as an on-site manager, but not as a rider <laughs> yet. And I'm like, you know, see, so there was a struggle there, and I've been very honest about that in the book and, and kind of my frustrations around that. But, 
yeah, it just became, you know, we moved a trailer onto the property and I moved into that and was, you know, we had a plug-in um, generator with an air conditioning unit and charger for my phone and laptop and one light and I was loving it. Like, I got to live out there in sort of the wilderness. There were bobcats and alligators and snakes and all sorts that were roaming around and, um, man, I just loved it. Like, being amongst the team every day building the ramps and rails and everything that we wanted and just yeah had an epic time um you you would have read about the mushroom trip that we had yeah. and that was sort of at the end of that really tough season we'd all just worked and built this place into our our own paradise and so that's what brought on that amazing sort of uh mushroom trip that we all had and um so yeah it was really cool and then obviously that led to the following year I came back we started building bigger and biggest things we had the mega ramp that came about and as I said I didn't I wasn't winning all the events and or any of them at that point on the pro tour but my angle was landing new tricks going bigger than anyone else whatever I could um, you know new stunts pushed on because the struggle for money you thought that doing bigger stunts would attract sponsors but yeah both that and just because it's what I enjoyed about the sport you know it's a freestyle sport you can take it whatever angle you want There and there were some guys that were not competing at all and they were making money out of video parts and kind of setting themselves aside in that way so I was sort of pursuing that angle because um, is this a time in history where that sort of X Games mentality like that like Bam Majera and all those guys are putting out those kind of viral vids or is that kind of the tail end of that We'd, just to timestamp it we, we missed well I missed the X Games era um, at both ends to be honest so like right as I was kind of getting to that sort of uh, elite level um, I think it was maybe 04 or 05 uh, wakeboarding stopped being a part of the X Games right um, and then it was like around about the time of my injury they brought it back in more as like the video part um, like the real street, real wake um, style, and that that happened around the time of my injury. So, uh, but yeah, it was it was a hundred percent. You know that that freestyle sport, make what you want of it. You know, express yourself, and and I'd loved going big, and I blew my knee from a hard landing, and that's where I found like the the spillway up and uh, down in Tokoroa, where I sort of gapped up a concrete dam basically, and um, I just wanted to go big and that was a way to have a soft landing and then 2014 we had the mega ramp um, that we built at Lake Ronex so for anyone who sort of doesn't know and wants to picture it it's almost, almost like your freestyle motocross type landing ramp but floating on the water and then we had the takeoff ramp was actually in an elevated pool that we dug into a peninsula um, so it was probably like maybe two and a half meters above the level of the lake where I was taking off from and so it just meant we could go really big and then have this nice soft landing down the landing ramp like kind of sort of to smooth the landing out and then and, and to continue um, painting that picture it's a cable system as well right it's not you're not behind a boat yeah, on this thing yeah similar to a T-bar on the ski field um, where it, this one just takes you back and forth one rider at a time and um, so we had two of those set up on the, on the property and uh, it just meant we could you know, you can set up different like handrails and obstacles and by having the bi-level set up where you got the, the one body of water above the other, you could have down rails or like step ups into the pool. It really like broadened the horizons of creativity that we could play with. Um, and yeah, the mega ramp, I just, I loved it. Um, I learnt, I kind of picked up my nuts and learned to double flip over it and then got invited to an event in Germany, which is where I landed the double tantrum to blind. So it's, for snowboarders, it's sort of, it's a double backside rodeo nine. So it's two backflips, just straight backflip, and then a blind 180 rotation. And because I'm holding onto the rope as well, the handle, uh, when I land, I've got the handle behind my back, kind of getting pulled, you know, in a position we called wrapped. Um, and yeah, it was uh, the first of its kind of that track, you know, and not just like, you know, there were, hadn't been done behind a boat, hadn't been done off a kicker, and then 
I'd taken it to kind of the gnarliest place you could do it, which was on a mega ramp. Can we just um, pause for a second? How do they come up with the names or the tricks? Like a double tent? Like a, it's one of those things, like, you land it, you get to name it whatever the hell you want. Is that right? Is yeah. that how it works? Yeah. yeah so beforehand, you're like, oh, I'm going to do a double flip, and then I'm going to land this, and then you land it, and you go, that's a double tantrum to blind. Well, no, so, yeah, so the, the, the name tantrum is just a straight backflip, so it was already right. an existing one in, in wakeboarding, and, you know, to blind and everything, it was sort of, it was the ex- existing name, I just did, was the first to do it double. Right. Um, but then you get, like, some people, they'll, you land a new trick and they'll call it the billion dollar baby or like you know there was uh one of the boys shane bonifay landed when he was young landed these new tricks called it like a tootsie roll and a <laughs> dum-dum like naming after it you know american candy and and then when you're thinking of these things and you're like in you is it just like this you're sitting around going i'm gonna do a double fl- and then i'm gonna do this and people are going oh <laughs> okay yeah right i like like is that kind of how that it, manifest itself that conversation there was, there was a little bit of that I mean I don't know about the trick names because I've never named a trick like right. I could have named the double tantrum and blind something else ridiculous but there was also the name was already existing I just kind of added double to it right so, right right <laughs> yeah. um, but no as a team it was quite cool like we'd uh, we're, especially with Lake Ronix when it came about like that just brought us all together so much closer as, as a team and it's so hot in Florida. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's like 100% humidity, around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It's just you're outside and just beating sweat. So we'd have the air conditioning cranking and stop for a lunch break and we'd all go in the, in the trailer and chill out, smoke a doobie, come up with ideas of stuff we wanted to do and things we wanted to build. And, and it was really cool just bouncing those ideas off each other and having that camaraderie and... Um, so that's where those couple of years, 2013, 14, were kind of the the most fun years of my career in, in that sense. And and I think it's because I'd found a home. You know, I, I really had found my place as like a team leader in a way. And not in like a bossing people around, oh, you go do that, you do this. It's like, hey, this is what we needs doing, like lead by, leading by example and... Um, yeah, it was just, it was rad. Like, especially with some of my idols as my teammates. Like, it was, yeah, it was fucking cool. Brad, before we go any further, and I maybe should have said this at the start, I, I wanted to check in with you about talking about this stuff. Because I've heard yeah. you say, like, looking back uh, can lead to depression, looking forward can lead to anxiety. We're yeah. about to get to the part where we talk about the accident, but you've been on this media tour like we've talked about, and you're sort of... I imagine everyone is asking you about the same thing like yeah. is it hard for you to talk like is it okay to talk about yeah I mean, I'm good talking about it all like so I've the accident happened when we were filming for a movie like a wakeboard film so I've got the crash in super high definition extra <laughs> slow-mo like I've seen it enough to process it so it doesn't affect me anymore um, and same with talking about it you know there might be the occasional thing that gets me a little choked up just because of you know, it could be talking about my mum and like what I put her through and, you know, certain moments where it's kind of still draws a bit of emotion. But no, I'm I'm happy talking about it all. It's um yeah, it's good. I I enjoy it and people are interested by it, so yeah. it's it's such a bittersweet thing to to hear the romance that you talk about it with now and knowing spoiler alert, like knowing how it, it ends up. It is like yeah. like to Stephen's point, like I I admire your courage in, in talking about that because a lot of the time we bury away the, the difficult things that happen in our lives and we don't want to deal with them so it's it, and yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's amazing bravery dude thank you and I think that's a big part of the book and my story and what I want people to, to gain from it is the power there is in vulnerability um, you know and, and opening myself up and you know my whole story and putting it out there is quite a vulnerable thing to do and and it's funny because what I found with social media I think it was my most liked post on social media for a while I don't know if it still is was when I posted about shitting myself it's like the strangest thing like <laughs> yeah. you know but people admired that vulnerability of going hey this is a reality of my life and how it is and how it's been it's like I think there's yeah there's there's a lot of power and in, in acknowledging and owning those parts of our lives and I guess that's kind of where the book title comes into it as well as um, 
Yeah, it's around that. But before you know, that's jumping. Bef- you know, but well, can, can we, we hang around in there for a second? Because I do. I like we, again. Stephen and I were talking about this in the lead up to it. Is like, is that just your like to your friends and stuff? Is it you just a normal dude? Like you just like me and Steve talk about like Steve shit himself outside his house <laughs> like a couple of years ago. <laughs> had some had some bad food in Hamilton. Came home late. Didn't want to wake his wife and kids up. So slept out, elected. I'm going full. I'm going yeah, full go detail. It, I'm going no, full no, detail. Okay. Uh, get my it. permission. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like slept outside. It was pissing with rain. Like, <laughs> basically upset stomach. Shat outside between the house and the garage. Uh, knocked on the door. His wife opened up. He shit all over himself. Came in for a shower and then messaged us all the next day, telling us all that this had happened. It's sort of a similar process, right? Is that what it's like with you and your mates that you 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 delve into these kind of details? So. Nice, they can, nice icebreaker there, mate. Yeah. yeah. No, we, um, we, I mean, obviously we joke about that sort of stuff if it happens and, um, can, as you say, it can happen to anyone. Um, but yeah, it just sort of became a part of the things that I was dealing with with my injury and would happen uh, quite commonly. It doesn't happen as much, you know, it hasn't happened in a few years, which has been nice. Um, but no, there was a point actually... And again, it's in the book where I was at a friend's wedding and we're, you know, or before the wedding and um, me and one of the bo- boys were chatting and I he asked me how I was and I kind of glazed over it and, you know, as we all do, start t- talking about what we've been up to and this and that rather than actually the, the real question is, how are you? And um, so it was after that that we really, so me and this friend, he kind of, he doubled down on the question. You know, I'd, I'd, he'd asked it once, I glazed over it. He went, no, but how are you? And we sat and chatted for, for quite a while and both shared some stories and, you know, the things we're going through, ups and downs. And since then, we've actually, all of us as friends have opened up a lot more and we're just, you know, more willing to have those conversations because sometimes it just takes that first one to realize how powerful it can be and... Um, you know, and we've got to lean on each other as mates as well. It's something that we, as you say, we can push that stuff aside and be a bit blokey and, you know, I don't know. I just think it's a, it's something that uh, as men we need to get better at is just talking about the real shit, even and if it is real shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this this app's going to go all over the show, so I was going to try to keep it in a linear, but I'm just going to ask what I'm thinking of right now. And it's that you are you have the same brand. You are the same Brad that you've always yeah. been, so you want to be treated the same. And it got me thinking, I was talking to Shay about how we were going to greet you when you came here, right? Because normally we would shake your hand when you yeah. came in. And I read in the book that one of your friends introduced the sort of the head touch, the head, as your new, yeah. uh, the head bump as your new greeting. So I was thinking, well, do I do the head bump? with Brad like would you want strangers to do the head bump with me? and I bottled it I didn't I sort of just stood there and, and sort of waved you in yeah. but like when you're like how, how how would you like people to to receive you I think um, I mean if yeah if people are comfortable doing that with themselves then then I'm all for it um, with you know with the head bump that you know usually with guys it's head bump kiss on the cheek with girls like sort of just yeah um, for me it was a way to to connect again with with my boys um we used to like do the old slap pound kind of um thing and it was just such a habitual thing that it just felt odd not being able to do it so um for a while there i was kind of discouraging the the head bumps during covid <laughs> times, but, yeah, um, it makes sense but no and it, and it's kind of you get different ones like i don't know i think someone that I maybe not, don't know as much like generally they probably come in from the side and it's sort of like a side on bump if I haven't seen like a good mate in a while like if someone who's you know like a real close mate they'll come in and like grab the back of my head and like force their forehead against mine hold it there for a second yeah. they even be like chat while they're there oh fucking good to see you mate you know yeah. sort of almost like a hongy kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. um, kind of greeting but yeah there's different different versions of it or different levels based on kind of how well I know someone or whatever, but yeah, I'm all for the head bumps. Okay, next um, time, next time we see you, we're head bumping. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we've, I think we've broken that. Yeah, now. We yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, nice. Um, if it's okay with you, I, w- I will get us back to to what happened. Um, yeah. in as much or as little detail as possible. Uh, with the um, double tantrum to blind. 
Yeah, so as I said, I'd landed it in Germany. Uh, we had footage of it like at the, the Red Bull Rising High event, uh, which I landed in practice, but not in the main event. So I ended up getting fourth, I think. Um, but we were filming this movie called Prime, which was like the biggest filmmaker in the industry at the time. He's the type of guy that will have like helicopters filming, helicopters filming wakeboarding like and drones flying out at the same time. Like he just goes, goes full on with it. And so we had been given the opportunity to do a Lake Ronick section for our team and we'd f already filmed most of it. And then came down to like one more day of filming. And cause I'd, most of the filming had happened before I went to Germany and landed this track. So I was like, okay, I got this new track. It's going to be the banger that just closes the section. And so it was that Sunday morning, 6th of July, 2014. The team got there and we like started riding, uh, me and one of my buddies, um, Dino. And um, we were kind of taking turns, swapping out. And then I was going for the double tantrum of blind, but sort of warming up into it. And even like my double tantrums, before that like I wasn't getting a super clean landing they just didn't I didn't feel as on as I was kind of hoping but I was like oh it's the last day you know struggling for sponsorship I'm 27 years old I need to make an impact like even though I've landed this trick already like I need it to be the final banger in this movie and like sponsors will love it they'll you know I'll start getting paid so I was like okay I need to, need to land this and then after you know 20 minutes and starting to actually go to blind on them kept falling over my heels and getting grazed up on the surface of the landing ramp and just getting so frustrated I was getting so close on a couple of them and then I went for the next one and because I was slipping falling back over my heels when I'd land I I cut a little harder and I pushed off the ramp a bit harder to go bigger because I was like okay just a little more time will allow me to get over my toes and land a bit more solidly and then I'd learn to double flip by doing the first half of the first flip real fast open out halfway through and then just kind of cruise the second half of that flip and then it means that I know I have enough time to do a second flip and commit to it pick up the nuts and and go um, and so yeah I'd kind of got you know that was my bailout point like, so when I was learning it, but also if something felt wrong, I could let go of the grab, open up, not do the second flip, and kind of ride away all right. And I'd done that a few times. And then uh, this one, I think the combination of cutting harder and pushing, pushing harder, and then when I bailed out, it was like maybe a split second later than I should have. And the combination, I just straight away was like, oh, fuck. Like, this is this is not going to end, end well. And I... You know, everything slowed down. I had enough time to think, okay, well, if I carry on as I am, I'm going to do it one and a half flips and definitely fuck myself up. Um, so I still had ten tension through the rope and the handle I was holding on to. So as I was kind of floating out of this first flip and um, kind of looking down, I tugged on the rope and it spun my body. So rather than going into a second flip, it spun me horizontally and I did 270 degrees of a spin, 90 degrees short of landing it or like at least bailing out and not, you know, not coming off um, second best. But yeah, 90 degrees short. So instead of the nose of my board heading down the ramp, it was my toes facing down the ramp and tumbling forward, got my feet down. But And then again, I was like, okay, I'm about to go face first into the ramp. I want to fuck up my modeling career. <laughs> um, <laughs> was it really that uh, fast? That you I, don't, I don't know if that part <laughs> went through my head, but I was like, oh, shit, I'm about to go face first. Like, So I just thought to do a break fall, you know, like tuck and roll out of it. And sometimes, you know, if you have enough time to push a little bit with your legs, you can kind of roll, you know, tuck into a good roll, but... I was just coming down so fast. I was probably dropping from two stories above the landing ramp going at 25 mile an hour or something. Um, and so, yeah, it just 
tried to tuck my head under but I just slammed into the ramp knocked out cold instantly and I guess my head was kind of forced into my chest so it kind of hit the back of my head as I was rolling forward and shattered my C4 vertebrae it blew the helmet off my head and I just tumbled into the water and was left there floating face down um, and the crazy thing was one of my teammates I had there a guy named Chad Sharp who's like legend in the sport he and I had just before that gone and done a CPR course um, and a lot of it was around water safety and they'd taught us how to stabilize a spinal cord injury in the water so I mean I'd I'd made sure he was going to be there even if he wasn't going to ride because he's the only one that else that had done it and I knew there was high risk here so yeah him and Dino like Dan, by that point Dean had already stopped riding he had kind of he was feeling off he was like okay yeah now I'm done whereas I just kept pushing and so they both just raced to me um, I think Chad grabbed the stand up paddle board brought it out to me and then um, they you know flipped me over I was eyes wide open blue in the face not breathing not responding Dino thought I was dead um, they pulled me up onto the paddle board and were about to do CPR or try and do CPR there just floating on the lake um, and again I like to make a bit of a joke here where must have known one of my buddies was about to put his lips to mine because I started breathing on my own and <laughs> regained consciousness and before he did um, and then yeah that's when it was kind of mayhem like in my head I was reflecting back on a previous like minor injury I'd had where I'd gotten whiplash and paralyzed for 30 seconds or so and so initially I'm like it'll come back it'll come back just relax and then by the time they got me to the shore I was like I was like where's my board and they're like oh you don't worry about it it's still here and then like two minutes later oh you take my board off and they're like we already took it off dude and so like I just didn't know what was going on couldn't feel anything trying to move couldn't move uh, first responders got there the local fire department like record time I don't know how they got there so fast and then that's when they kind of cut all, cut my life jacket off me and um, put a neck brace on put me on a backboard and then that's when I heard <laughs> Chad on the phone hey we need to bring in the chopper I'm like don't you bring in that fucking helicopter like it's going to be so expensive because um, I had no insurance I you know I'd, I'd just gotten a visa to go live there for five years and so I was starting to look into insurance after my travel insurance had run out. Um, so yeah, and then it was just yeah hectic, like uh, a lot going on. The helicopter came in and they flew me off to the ICU. And um, yeah, I'd, I've got like a week blank after after the MRI at the ICU, which I remember, you know, anyone who's had an MRI, they, they tell you, oh, this is going to take a while make sure you lay still I was like fuck <laughs> you dude come on <laughs> oh man uh, so, so okay now we're into post accident Brad and yeah. the eight year journey has been incredible like the roller coasters that I've read about in the book and the way that you've managed to train your mind to get through it and get into a place which is incredible like the, the light and the enthusiasm and the joy you have for life is like I'm really looking forward to getting to that but if you will in those first few weeks when you kind of came out of your blackout I guess and you were able to process what it meant where was your mind then um I mean at first I thought I was in some chicks room I'd gone home with from downtown and drank too much and didn't remember where I was <laughs> and then it kind of all caved, caved in and crashed down on me that you know the reality of what had happened and at this point I'm you know I'd gone through a nine hour surgery to piece my neck together I think they put a cadaver vertebrae in so they borrowed it from a dead person um, because I just destroyed my vertebrae Um, and you know a couple of rods and plate and 14 screws to hold my neck together on a ventilator I had pneumonia um, so there was a lot going on getting you know everything through a feeding tube through my nose and I wanted to die I wanted to kill myself I wanted to I just did not want to continue I was like this is fucked like I've completely ruined my life I've ruined everyone's life 
around me. Um, it just was so heavy that, yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to continue. But I was in the situation where I was like, even if I wanted to kill myself, I can't. Like, but then it's sort of a catch twenty two where it's like, if I could move my arms and hold a gun to my head and pull the trigger. I wouldn't need to because I've got enough movement to feel like life would be worth yeah. living. Yeah. So it was this weird sort of, yeah, this weird, weird place to be in. But it, it may have taken a week or so after that, you know, gradually I was seeing all the messages of support coming in. My family were there. Um, the wakeboard community with, you know, there was some fundraisers and stuff that were starting to get organized. And so all of the stuff going on, I was like, okay, maybe, you know, m- maybe this is worth fighting. Was that the flicker of light that you kind of held on to? Was this the, the external support from people? Yeah, yeah, it was that. And there was the the other element was when the doctor told me I had a 1% to 2% chance of ever regaining upper limb function. <laughs> there was the other part of me that was like, fuck you, I'm going to prove you wrong, even though I kind of haven't. But... Um, that was a driving factor for me as well it was like say i can't and i will um and then as well i had a had a well sort of a girlfriend at that point it was a weird one like we were hanging out and you know and i'd gone to see her and uh we'd spend a bit of time together like leading up to the accident but we'd already established right before it that it wasn't going to work because you know she lived in a different state things weren't lining up and kind of just got to the point just being mature about it okay this isn't going to work next thing I get smoked in an accident and she rushes to my bedside and oh I want to be with you I want to have your babies I want to come to live to New Zealand move in New Zealand look after you and blah 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 told me everything I needed to hear in my most vulnerable state which was amazing it helped she was the angel I needed at the time but then a couple months later like that fizzled out and before I even came home, um, that it ended. Uh, well, she was religious, right? Is, is that the one that you were sort of had the the differing beliefs when yeah. she was wanting to pray for you, and you were saying, "Well, no, if if God's done this to me, God's a dick." Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and that wasn't the main you know thing that separated us. It was because um, I was I was open. You know, she can have her thing. I can do it my way. We can kind of find a mutual ground of okay maybe it's the same energy of some sort love versus prayer versus you know whatever putting out good vibes um but it was more i think what what it really came down to was uh she wasn't willing to move from where she was um you know obviously has her family and things like that and it's understandable i didn't really expect her to just uplift everything and move to New Zealand and come and be with me and especially when she'd already decided she didn't want to move a couple of states to be with me as a 6 foot 2 model pro athlete yeah. like why would she move to New Zealand to be with me as a quadriplegic like it's sort of I, you know I felt like her intentions were were good like it was coming from a good place it was coming from love but she just hadn't thought it completely through into how committed she really was to the words she was saying at the beginning um and i you know from the very beginning when she came in hot after my accident i was like really yeah like <laughs> like right. i fucking love that like this is great this is like the girl i wanted is telling me everything i want to hear yeah. but really like there was an it's quite well documented because i think sunday sent a tv crew over at the same time right so you've got yeah. tv cameras in your face as well like that must yeah that whole Situation of dealing with processing life changing news, you've got cameras here, you've got like man, that's an overwhelming, yeah, situation was, to be. I mean, in. even before that, we had, we'd had an interview or a, a story, it's an American show, it was quite big, can't remember what it, what it is off the top of my head. And we'd said, like, or my, my family had said to them, Hey, look, unless we agree to it, unless he's in the right frame of mind, we're not going to do an interview at this point and then they just cheekily came in and started asking me questions and stuff and I was just like come on guys I wasn't in a great place at that point um but yeah so like there's obviously the time in the ICU was just madness like on the ventilator the whole time my heart stopped at one point while I was trying to wean off the ventilator 
um, in, in those in those first few weeks, when you're waking up, is it kind of like when you wake up from a really bad hangover and you're kind of like, geez, what happened last night? Oh, fuck, that's right. Like every time, are you coming and thinking, oh shit, I'm a, I'm a quad, I'm a quadriplegic. Yeah, and I think after you know after a few weeks, it was like waking up and I'm just like, really, like, you know, I'd, I'd come out of like an epic dream. And it's just, it, you know, life was the nightmare as opposed to waking up from a nightmare into reality and being like, ah, oh, okay, like, it was just a nightmare. This is the opposite. It was like waking up like, oh, that was an epic ride. Oh, fuck, like, I'm back in this shit. And, you know, there'd be like the 5 a.m., the, the x-ray guy would come in to x-ray my lungs. I'm like, what the hell are you doing this at 5 a.m., dude? Come on, like so there was yeah there was just so much going on um and just such a wrestle mentally uh as to whether i wanted to continue or not and and just you know whether i wanted to or not i had no option at that point it was just like every day this is you know this is what you're in for and then you know it started with some physio and i, I was so unwilling to to really even give that a go they're like okay try move your arm i'm like i'm trying like i can't try any harder than i'm trying no matter how many times you tell me to try uh and it just felt like a as much as i wanted to give it everything it's there wasn't that first tiniest little bit of movement for me to build off so i felt like there was just nothing to even start from um but the, you know that's when they the start get, getting me out of the bed and sitting upright again which my blood pressure was just fucked at that point I'd pass out and um, yeah there's just so many different things that, that were going on and then we finally um, you know I'd weaned off the ventilator or tried a couple times and then they ended up um, after my heart stopped the one time uh, they they stopped letting me um, try to get off the ventilator again but they gave me a, a speaking valve in, in the um, in the vent so it meant because like they cut a hole in your neck and it goes down through you know the tracheotomy so it goes down through into your lungs and they inflate a balloon above that point so that the air just doesn't rush straight out through your mouth so it meant I couldn't speak couldn't eat couldn't drink um, and then yeah they, they put the speaking valve on and it so that would let air Oh, they'd what would they do? They'd let air come in through the vent, but then they'd um, deflate the balloon so it would come back out through my mouth. So I'd I'd have to like learn to control the air pressure that was being pumped in, as opposed to like opening my esophagus or trachea to to breathe in. It was like I'd have to. I'd have to close it off to allow the air in, and then I'd have to open it to let it back out, like. I don't know, it was, it was just a weird thing. It was almost backwards breathing. Yeah, counterintuitive. Yeah. And, um, but I was able to speak again, and then they finally, like, let me start eating again. And then I got moved to the Shepherd Center, um, which is up in Atlanta. There's a big spinal unit there, which I was so lucky to get a, a scholarship to be there. Because that would have been 300 grand US, probably. Um, Cause you're, you're, you're too fragile at that stage to, f to medivac back to New Zealand? Yeah. So they put me on a little Cessna type medivac plane to to get me up to the spinal unit, um, and then that's where they b they basically gave me the goal, which again for me that's all I need. Tell me I need to do this to achieve that, I'll fucking do it. Um, they just said you need to do 18 hour days off the ventilator for I think it was like six days in a row. Um, I was like, all right, cool, a goal, let's do this. So I started building up my time time off the ventilator again um, to the point where I was, I think it was 16 hour days, but then I was pushing it to 18 hours because I just wanted to be able to keep speaking with, you know, my girlfriend at the time. And um, Was that the competitive side of, of wakeboarding that helped you? Like, did that did that sporting background help that, that part of your recovery? Yeah, for sure. That and, like, the, just the physical, like, um, just the rehab you know it was it was what I was used to I'd blown my knee I'd gone through rehab for that before um, yeah I was I was used to it and it was just 
yeah, give me a goal, give me a target, and and you know I'll I'll do what I can to get there. Was that bringing you a sense of like was there anything bringing you joy at that point like was talking to friends or seeing social media people like writing about you or was it all just sort of doom and gloom um there, you know there were moments of joy you know like a girlfriend running around the room with, with her tits out and, um you know like little that's like, yeah that's joyous regardless of oh, it's great. Like, who yeah. doesn't enjoy that you know that's a good time. um you know and then like i'd have my teammates would come up and visit and i remember we're like we were able to go out of the hospital to this little garden out the back and kind of chill in there. And, and I remember like when I was back in bed afterwards and one of my teammates, Massey, is just like pouring Skittles into my mouth and just, you know, we're like, we're just having a good time. And that was actually the first time where I actually felt like I had a little bit of fun um, with, with them coming up and seeing me. And then there's one of my other buddies would like bring me... Um, I think he got through a friend like some uh thc oil some actual medical oil that he'd come in and just like squirt some onto a bit of candy and just like, pop it in my mouth like when my mum was like there hanging yeah. out or whatever, like. <laughs> but it was just something you know it's just a little tiny sense of normality amongst the chaos that was going on um, i think this is a good time to ask because i didn't actually ask at the start but you talked about your girlfriend running around uh, with her top off when you're having s- sex at when you were at a place when you could, he's got the balls to ask the questions now. Was that? Way. Yeah, if I've had my beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually, I know, I know the answer to it, but I want to hear you talk about it because you really described it really well in the book. And it's like, well, a norm- normal orgasm is a nine out of ten, and the feeling of first entry might be a seven out of ten. So yeah. sex for me was like a zero point two out of ten. <laughs> Pretty much. That's that's what the feeling is for me. So, and I was blown away. To actually, I was like, oh my god. I feel something actually pleasurable below my my level of injury because other than that it's just pain constantly so right now it's like a two or three out of ten pain in terms of like pins and needles like you ever do the where you go from like ice cold water into a hot tub and it just burns it's like a freezing cold burns burning sensation it's like that at all times for me and then you throw in all the other pain that I get from like um, the catheter that I've got in or you know the bowel issues I've had recently and um, there's not a lot of good feeling below my level of injury and so to get that 0.2 out of 10 <laughs> at 2% like that was just um, that was really cool it gave me something to be you know to focus on in those moments where I was really struggling you know having sex as a quadriplegic I couldn't move I couldn't reach up and touch and grab and you know change position do anything like I was just a spectator yeah. <laughs> laying there and like I'm like okay so at least it gave me like visually I could enjoy that but I mentally I just at first I couldn't enjoy it because it was just constantly compar- comparing it to what it used to be and it's like this is not what sex is supposed to be and um so yeah, that was a that was a tough thing to come uh, to to sort of come around to was more just steering my focus toward what I do have, what I do enjoy, what I am grateful for, as opposed to constantly comparing and going, it's not what it used to be. I can't do this. I can't do that. So yeah, nice. So okay, so this is where it gets to the really inspiring part, and and I'm glad we needed to paint the picture to get here. But yep. the next eight years or maybe seven years whatever the time frame is there's been setbacks there's been constant set you just were in surgery a few months ago but like i said you are you're you've got such a positive outlook on life and you've got there through these tools that you've created for yourself and i know that you were focusing on that one or two percent to get your your limbs back um you did that seven days a week for three years you fought for it and then it was a setback and you didn't get it and then but you have managed to get yourself... I'm sort of rambling here. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to say. But you are inspiring because everyone goes through hard times and everyone deals with shit. But I don't think anyone has dealt with the situation you have, but you've managed to get yourself to a place that you've found comfort and you've found happiness. So can you just take us through that journey to, to how you've done it? Yeah, so it was, you know, after being in that spinal unit for like three months, I think, 
got back to New Zealand, was straight back to our spinal unit here, which is a pretty miserable place. Um, I think any spinal unit is really. Um, and then it wasn't until like February that next year that I moved into my own home that, you know, was already wheelchair accessible and everything. It was already built for, for someone in a wheelchair or at least modified for it. Um, but it's it was then that a lot of the mental struggles started because up until that point I was surrounded by, you know, I was A, in a hospital. You expect to leave hospital better. It's just kind of the expectation generally. And, um, and I was surrounded by other people in the same situation and next thing I'm out in the, the real world, everything's the same except me. I'm like, oh, I recognize, you know, I recognize everything except myself. Um, and I just, I'd kind of, the, yeah, that's where I really started to struggle mentally and I was really lucky to have a uh, a friend help out, a woman named Susie. She's a kinesiologist. She, she sounds kind of, amazing, by the way. She's an incredible woman. Um, she owns a Pilates studio, Suna Pilates on the shore um, here in Auckland. And I used to go there for just core strength and conditioning and everything before my accident. Um, and yeah, and she, was in, she does kinesiology and I won't even butcher explaining what it is but it's kind of a the connection between emotions and the body and the the organs and ways that they can kind of uh, affect each other and and so she came and just started like chatting with me and we we're just kind of working through whatever issues would come up first with guilt you know the way I could barely look at my mum in the eyes and just seeing the pain kind of reflected back and um, and then you know inadequacy issues and feeling like a burden and how long did it take things. to build that trust? Was it almost was it instant or did it, did it was it a little bit of give and get? It wasn't instant. The first time like she came in and we chatted and I was like okay you know this is great to talk about but sort of like I didn't feel like she was the one to really be talking about it all with until she shared with me that she had been through her own shit. Um, her own really massive struggles and that was through losing twins and childbirth um, uh, and so you know I can't imagine what that would be like and obviously very different situations but obviously very similar in terms of the impact it would have on you so that's when I was like okay maybe she knows a bit of what you know what what the uh, the struggle is and just as we were kind of chatting each time and she was you know open up some you know give me some wisdom that uh that she would share about a certain topic and some of it was a bit too like bit of a leap and i was like eh, i don't like i i i get it but i i don't know if i can apply it and so yeah it just took a bit of time and it basically became you know i think i called the chapter mondays with susie um off you know a, a book that i'd previously read called tuesdays with murray which was really good um and so yeah she'd come and just chat with me and we'd just she'd come over and wouldn't even try to like draw anything out it was just like hey what do you want to chat about today and i would just go into whatever shit i was dealing with mentally and so it was a long process you know i had the physical rehab to focus on but then after three years of full-on physical rehab and not really much to show for it that's when i felt like i was kind of at the lowest point where I got to like and Susie had been teaching me all these things but I was just still struggling to apply a lot of them and I ended up back at the spinal unit for some pain issues and I was going to be there for two weeks I was like okay no social media no distracting myself with anything I'm going to sit with the shit I'm going to figure it out because I'm not happy I'm, I'm not okay and if I continue like this I'm going to continue to not be okay um, so it was like okay I'll you know sit there and first day I was there I just cried a lot um, everything felt so unfair and yeah and I just started like feeling what it, what it was that I was going through what, it, what the issue was and Susie had taught me to sit with emotions and not push them aside um, and try to learn from them and so that's what I did while I was there and is your process exactly that just like just being just feeling what you feel like do you yeah do you feel it and go okay what 
what led to this like what was i thinking what was i doing was i mindlessly scrolling social media which a lot of the time it was if i was seeing my friends like wakeboarding and having an epic time and i felt like i was missing out or you know looking at like women and ex-girlfriends or you know girls that are hooked up with in the past they're now getting married or having kids and i just like it just it, it affected me so much um until i learned that it has nothing to do with me a lot of that stuff it's you know that's not in my current reality and what i have control of and so a lot of what susie was teaching me was around presence um because leading up to that point i with the physical rehab i was trying to get back to where i used to be Mm. looking at the past going that's where i need to be trying to go backwards and so that's what kind of steered me into that depression and um and yeah so it was more about just kind of i think that time at the spinal unit those two weeks there was to like process everything and i kind of came to the realization that the main reason i couldn't take on all these learnings susie had it was teaching me was that I hadn't taken on the first one which was acceptance um, and it, again it was all around what I believed acceptance was which was I thought everything around what I assumed ab- about being a quadriplegic was like, life's going to be miserable no one's going to want to be with you you're never going to have any fun yada 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 so that was what I thought I had to accept which was not the truth it was I just need to accept that this is where I am now um and the future is what I want to make of it. So, um, yeah, and that's where the switch kind of went from. Okay, I'll, I'll take this on, and I can and try and like take on these learnings that she's she's teaching me. And it was like, all right, I need to stop focusing on the past. I need to stop looking back. Um, Got to stop focusing on what I can't do, what I don't have, all these sorts of things. Um, and what I don't like about my life start focusing on what I can do what I do have, what I'm grateful for what the possibilities might be and that's where you know, I I started looking going, okay, like, what can I do for fun like, um, you know, and even at that point I'd had I'd had a girlfriend, I'd had another girl fall in love with me that didn't even know me before the accident, gorgeous, gorgeous girl amazing, you know, beautiful human where did you meet her? Uh, just at a housewing party a friend brought her along and it was just like a very natural authentic meeting and I I, you know in the place I was that was right after I moved into my the house so I was I was like eight months out of an injury um, out of that injury and uh, I didn't think you know I was like I met this gorgeous girl I'm like cool you know in the back of my mind I'm like would have would have hooked up with her before but it's not going to happen now <laughs> And then next thing she said, you know, was like, hey, I want to, you know, let's meet up for coffee. And then she started coming around and, you know, would come hang out, cook a dinner. And then next thing, yeah, it kind of progressed. And, and again, like, I won't ruin the story, but I screwed up, you know, several uh, options and relationships and stuff back then. But I, I really had to, the whole process was learning to love myself again. And it was going okay I don't have to love everything about my life and I don't have to love my injury but I can love myself for what I've gone through and and the way I've handled it and how brave I've been how I've taken this on and the fact that I'm still here you know and it's it's a lot of the stuff actually ties in with something that came in very early on which was the seven um, Huna wisdoms which uh, my auntie sort of sent them to me and I stuck them on a bit of paper above my bed and would look up at the ceiling and read over these things and you know one of them's like the world is what you think of it it is or um, energy flows where attention goes um, you know it's, it's a lot of mindfulness stuff about the power that we have to steer our intention our, our mentality toward the positive and what we want to focus on because um, right now I could still be miserable I could focus on the fact that that I am in pain and that I'm still sitting in my wheelchair I haven't got my movement back but it's like what's that going to do for me you know, it's not bringing anything positive to my life and um, you know I've learned that I've got the, the power to kind of steer my mind to 
to toward being grateful toward being um you know the, toward the things that i love and it's like you've, you've turned yourself into a zen master right you've got this tool bag of things that have just allowed you this new outlook it on was life. funny susie told me she's like you know maybe one day you won't even need to learn you'll just uh, won't even need to walk you'll just float everywhere <laughs> you'll just guru float and um but yeah totally it was like i've just it's about like having the tools there to to apply to the situations um have you heard of a guy called hugh van kylenberg an aussie guy he's put out a book called the resilience project I've heard of the book. I didn't, re- not the name yeah. on the top of my head. So his, his three things are gratitude, empath- empathy, and mindfulness. And listening to you speak, as I've heard you before, reading what's in here, like the, the principles are totally the same. And that yeah. book just resonated with me so much. And I think, fuck, even like my own, like I'm listening to you talking, I'm thinking of my own situation, I'm going, fuck, like, he's so right. Just be grateful for like what you've got and where yeah. you are right now. Don't fucking worry about and th- that and that doesn't shit. mean that we can't like pursue big things and go after what we want and you know and like even with being you know living in the present and not getting you know too far into the future and part, like we can be dreamers we can still like push for things and and dream up new things that we want to do and but it's not it's it's about like making it a goal not an expectation if we expect ourselves to be anything other than what we are then we're going to be uneasy and you know not at ease with with what how things um, with how our life is and so yeah it's it's really about having the tools to to bring on you know I've said this a couple of times in, in interviews but it it really is about like happiness is not a destination it's a journey and to expect you know we're we're almost like brainwashed and led to believe that. If, if I get this, I'll be happy. If I get that car, if I have this this many followers, if I get enough this amount of money, I'll be happy. And it's not true. Like there might be momentary joy from getting that, but it's about realizing it's a journey, knowing that life's going to throw shit at us regardless, and you know can be diff- different levels of shit. Obviously, I'm going through a, you know sort of the higher end of that, but at the end of the day, like you know be the loss of a loved one could lose your job could be financial struggles could be anything um you know and even like health like cancer no one can control that it just comes at you so for me it's like it's not expecting to to find a life that doesn't have the struggles it's having the tools that i need to be able to get through those struggles and and learn from them and get better at dealing with them each time are you bulletproof at this point? Like, obviously, you still have your struggles and you still have bad days, but is there no set of circumstances that could pull you back under? Are you that well equipped that you will always rise above it? Um, I think I will, but that's because I realise that there are those moments where it feels like all hope is lost or everything's fucking horrible and, you know, you might not be able to see the way out of it, but when you realize that it's momentary and that there is that it is a journey and that like if you think that life's shit and everything's miserable it's just like the your story's not finished yet like you there's yeah i don't know if i'd say i'm bulletproof but there's that like shit happens and i just i feel like i've got the tools now to to bring myself back out of it um a lot quicker than I used to be able to and I think that's the main thing is like there's this analogy that I like to use um, which is sort of it's a common one you can almost do it right now that glass of water that's in front of you if you're holding that in your hand for 30 seconds or a minute it's it's fine there's no issues a few hours your arm's going to get pretty sore if you hold on to it all day your arm's almost going to feel pretty much paralyzed you probably won't barely be able to lift it and they say, you know, this is the the usual analogy is that, okay, you know, the the weight of that glass is your stresses and worries and emotions and all the shit that's going on in your life that you're holding on to. Um, and that analogy usually ends about there and it's like, oh, you, you just got to let it go. Well, if you're holding on to a glass and you let it go, it's going to smash all over the ground and leave another mess to clean up later. 
or if you just put it down you still haven't addressed it it's still sitting there it's still an issue all those weights and you know stresses and worries and everything still exist so the way this is where I kind of took the analogy a step further how do you benefit from that glass of water you fucking drink it but you know it gets rid of the weight and you get to process it so same with all the stresses and worries and emotions if you process them if you drink them in and sit with them then the next time that issue comes up the next time you have to deal with something like that you're better prepared to to get through it like if you know and, and that's where also in the book we talk about belief systems and everything it's trying to understand what the issue is where it comes from and a lot of the time how bullshit it is and it's just something that we've built up in in society to mean something huge but maybe it doesn't mean anything um and metacognition is a huge part of that which is just our awareness of our own thoughts and emotions so like if something happens and all of a sudden you get an emotional reaction to go to take a second to go now why was that why did i respond that way and if you if you dig deep you can it might even go back to childhood trauma it might go back to something you learned at school or something a movie taught you or you know it's just it's there's so much that we've been taught throughout our lives that we can break down and and kind of see as something that actually doesn't mean that much if we you know my dad told me nothing has any meaning but the meaning we give it so that's putting the power back in our own in our own court it's um, it's it's really inspiring stuff and i know that your profile is growing as a public speaker as these yeah. sort of with the book and everything like that because you're so perfectly placed because like i said everyone's going through shit but you're you're right at the top so by being able to get through it and beat it and talk like this and articulate your message yeah. like i hope people listening to the, i know people listening to this are going to be touched like have you found that that is the best thing that has come of this your ability to help other people deal with their shit 100 percent. yeah um because yeah i've been you know people present the question if you could go back and change it would you well, fuck yeah of course i would regardless like you know and it's but that's it, it comes from two different perspectives it's like if i'd have been told right before my accident this is about to happen like you can change it of course i'm going to but like if I'm in this position now sure I know that how hard the journey's been but I also know the impact I'm able to have on others the fact that it's you know if, if you look at it from a less selfish way which you know going back and living my life as a pro wakeboarder is a more self-centered lifestyle that doesn't mean I wouldn't go and do it because it was fucking epic <laughs> like <laughs> you know but then I also that's me dreaming up the idea that everything was going to be perfect afterwards and go the way I wanted it to which more or li- more than likely wouldn't have um, so yeah I think now knowing the impact I'm able to have on others as much as it still um, isn't a life I would have chosen it's the best I can you know I'm doing the best I can with the life I've got and that's all we can do really and shit if I can inspire other people and, and help others whether they're in a situation like mine or just you know going through any daily struggles like f- to me that's a win and it just it makes it the, the shit that I have to go through somewhat worth it you know it's still a struggle still sucks but again to get the, that sort of response I love it after talks you know getting to chat with people especially kids at school or you know corporate events um i just yeah i love getting that sort of feedback and and just knowing you know and in a way that's a little bit of an ego thing you know to know oh, i've inspired others like it gives me purpose and it's you know but at the end of the day i think we need purpose to, to keep going we need something to drive us and um this book was a huge thing for me for my purpose and now that it's done i've got um got another project i'm working on which is exciting and um yeah even even considering another book possibly which 
writing that i was like no fucking way am i doing another book you got any sick stories left in the locker <laughs> no no, no. So, <laughs> so that's the idea is uh, i'm gonna write another book adults want, only vision no no no. the opposite one that can go to kids oh, okay it can, that can be handed out <laughs> to kids at school yeah but with the similar you know the similar messaging and stuff but just a little more digestible for the younger readers i was gonna say you like your story the breadth of people that you're able to reach as well because it, it is from kids right through to adults right like I'd say, I mean, that book would probably be yeah, like this maybe maybe not so late kids. teens, yeah. you know, <laughs> mid to late teens. But um, but no, I think there's that's the cool thing is there are, especially with the public speaking, I can tailor my talks a little bit based on, on the, um, the audience. And I think just in general, yeah, it's quite cool to be able to reach quite a wide audience. And, um, and as much as like the book, I think would be more suited for... For men, maybe, you know, let's say 16 to 40 or, you know, something like that, 45 even. But but I think, yeah, there's messages in there for everyone. And, like, I mean, all my editors and proofreaders and stuff were all women, um, which did, I, I leaned on them for the... Did, my, did, did much, much get taken out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Did you go more graphic? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah there, was, there was more graphic. There were was, any names changed? Yeah, I wanted Oh, to there were a lot of names changed. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, so you were we, protecting some we, identities. We won't be digging into who those people <laughs> yeah, are. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, but, yeah, there was uh, there was a lot of, a lot changed. I mean, my original draft was more than double what, the, wow. what made it in the book. And that's just because I'm, I mean, I am now, but I wasn't a writer, like, I didn't know how to shape a book. I just brain dumped everything. And yeah, we didn't mention this at the start, but you, you wrote it all with your mouth, with a pen in your mouth, right? 500,000 words on a phone across, yeah. what, six years? Six years, yeah. So it was, yeah, what's called a mouth stick. So it's just like a stylus that I, originally it was, you know, each single letter at a time, like a little woodpecker, like, and my neck would get so sore and my jaw and everything. But then, uh, Apple thankfully added swipe to text, which made things a bit faster and Are you are you enjoying me? writing some of those more erotic passages, knowing that someone else is gonna <laughs> gonna read them? Yeah, um, no, I like. You're really fixated on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've asked too many <laughs> questions, about, but it's, it is it is a lot of the book. <laughs> no, no, and it's I like I uh, that was the thing. Like this, as I said, there's there's a lot that didn't make it in. Um, from you know volume of um like other other women i'd written about um and again it's because i didn't know really what was important and what was you know i thought i'd let the let the editor decide um the ones you know that that kind of added to the story and yeah and it's just like i don't know i, I just was writing and i just kind of got carried away and part of it honestly like it was it was therapy for me it was mm. like writing a diary some of it was never really meant to see the light of day um but it gave the editors the full story to be able to to kind of help whittle it down into into what it is and, and that's the main thing i'm really proud of is actually writing it myself like the words are mine you know it was just more that the editor came in and trimmed and shaped it and maybe you know fixed a few mistakes here or there and yeah, what, was was the book launch an emotional night for you? Because you, you've spent so long on it. It's so important. It is your story. And then you're getting everyone, all of your friends and the people that have been involved together in one night. Like, was that? It was It was an amazing night, yeah. It was, I was I'd doing my speech at the start a little bit and got a little bit choked up. And, you know, because I brought Susie up and was like, hey, look, you know, we know that I wouldn't be here without you. There would be no book without you. It's sort of, um, yeah, it kind of, it was emotional and it was just great to acknowledge some of the people that were part of the journey um have a lot of people there to share the moment with and i think just in general it's been um honestly i was getting a bit nervous leading up to a bit of ang bit anxious leading up to the book launch but literally like since the day it came out since i started doing media and like it, it's just been received so well and i was just nervous i'm like did I go too much in terms of like the volume of sex and stuff in there? Did I, you know, like some of the shit that I've talked about sponsors, like how are they going to respond? Like, cause I mean, most of the women I spoke to and I was like, Hey, do you want your name changed or not? Some of the sponsors I didn't, I'm like, fuck it. That's what you did. That's how mm. the journey was. Like, 
I'm I don't need to cover this up you know I this I need this to be told as part of the story so how has the response been um it's been it's been really well received so far um there's a few people that I don't know if they've read it yet and there was the ones where I was like a little bit nervous like mm, how are they going to feel actually I did get some res- a response from one of my early sponsors that you know that didn't work out and I kind of talked a bit of shit about kind of the way it went down um and it was the daughter of the sponsor who reached out she's like I'm so sorry that that's how it ended I'm like water's so far under the bridge yeah. like you, we don't <laughs> yeah. need like apologies or anything it's just that I just needed yeah, to tell the story, story and yeah they're lucky I didn't put in other parts of the story that was yeah man there were some parts I was like oh why do we have to take that out but for legal reasons some of them we did and uh, start a, a sub stack or something and yeah. put all the all the other bits in there yeah um, I've just got uh, Shane might have a couple more questions I've just got one and it's kind of a, a bigger picture one It's and you sort of mentioned earlier that you've watched a replay of the accident many times when you look back and I'm not sure when the last time was but what do you think when you're watching a replay of the accident um now I'm like so glad we got that footage (laughs) so fucking stoked we got that um you know initially it was like ah why didn't you back it why didn't you do this why didn't you do that why'd you back out so late like you know just regret 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 like and it was just it took a while for me to get past that and to go to kind of be at peace with the fact that I think that was another thing that Susie taught me about presence it's like the amount of time we're spending on the past wishing and hoping we could change things it's like the amount of time we actually when we really realize it the amount of time as humans that we spend outside of reality in our minds is fucking crazy it's actually nuts how much we worry about things in the future it's like that future that you're thinking of and picturing is a figment of your imagination that you've just built up like we love to tell ourselves stories and I think the more we can bring things back into the present gratitude for what is right now um, you know like right now I'm fucking stoked to have been invited to come onto this podcast to chat to you lads and just like be able to share my story to have people interested in it people buying my book like it's just being really grateful for what is as opposed to yeah regretting things in the past wishing we could change things or fearing things in the future and kind of uh trying to like control things that are out of our control um so yeah that, that that's it i think like the main thing's just not uh yeah not trying to try not to have regrets it's hard you know there'll always be like those thoughts there of you know like the first love and you know different elements along the way that we wish we could change but when we realize that if we change anything in the past like anything that we're grateful for right now that we're stoked that is something that's happened in our lives almost means that we have to be grateful for everything that happened in our lives up to this point otherwise things may not have otherwise that thing we're grateful for might not happen um so that's a really powerful thing to break down that regret and everything in the past is just like realizing how drastically the journey could have changed had i not broken my neck you know in that crash that day I could might have gotten eaten by an alligator the next morning naked bloody bathing in the lake like we don't know um so yeah it's trying to keep things in in reality and how things are and cool thing is that having that footage of my crash means uh some epic footage for a documentary <laughs> Shay? nah i've got nothing to add okay in my outroing am i yeah give us the outro I, I line up Shay for an outro at the I end think, of every um, episode. I think just if I can... Yeah, please. I think for, for my outro, I just really love where the book ends. There's the, this beautiful full circle moment that kind of comes into play. And I think it's just, it's a really powerful thing that I, I hope people will take on and... Um, and realize that you know no matter what life throws our way 
I think that the best way to approach things is to know that everything's going to be okay regardless like and and even if things aren't okay like in certain elements we, we don't have control over some of those things so it's just learning what we don't have control over and not worrying about things that we don't have control of um yeah and the fact that being told no by a scuba dive doctor you know meant that I couldn't scuba dive like that was something I was just so gutted about but it led me to something that was so much more fulfilling um and I think that's just a really powerful thing for people to to kind of learn is um that story of maybe where we don't know like if you want to look up it's like a story of a Chinese farmer where you know his horse runs away and everyone's like oh it's terrible and he's like maybe and then the horse comes back with seven wild horses and everyone's like that's amazing and he's like maybe and then the son gets bucked off one of the horses trying to break it in the next day and breaks his leg and oh it's terrible maybe you know then war breaks out and they get drafted but the son doesn't have to go to war because he's got a broken leg and again it's like anything in our lives things happen and um we we put yeah we put meaning on it and we're like oh this is horrible and it means that the future is going to be like this we don't know what that terrible or amazing thing might lead to like the terrible thing could lead to the best thing in our lives it could lead to meeting your you know your your soulmate if you will or who knows so it's just like learn to embrace the journey for what it is and try not to uh get caught up in trying to control it just hang on for the ride there'll be people listening to this that want to hear more where, where can they get a hold of you uh, first of all read the book owning it read the, the book. ride that changed my life that'll give Brad you um, that'll give you a bit of a good insight but hey if you want to reach out shoot me a message um social media at brad smaler spell s-m-e-e-l-e -E -E. um yeah i'm always happy to to chat and to answer questions or if anyone's going through something or if you know someone who's had an injury like send them my way and um yeah don't be scared to reach out and and if you see me in the street come up lean in for a head bump um, if you don't have covid yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah mate i'm really inspired by the book i'm really inspired by your messages that you've given today not only today actually through your through your whole journey um i'm really proud that we've got a platform that's allowed you to maybe reach a different audience um and i'm really humbled at the way you can approach such a challenging thing that's happened in your life with humility with humor um and with relatability i will i i don't know your journey at all but i feel like i can empathize with it and that ability to communicate is really special um and I know it's taken you a lot of shit to get to that point to be able to articulate it now, but I'm really yeah. thankful that you are able to articulate it now. And I hope everybody out there has a chance to listen to this, to read this, to engage with you, to meet with you somewhere along the line because you're an incredibly special human. Thank you. Appreciate that. And yeah, appreciate you having me on and letting me, uh, you know, spread my voice to to new listeners. And I um, hope you've all enjoyed the enjoyed the chat. Cheers, Brad. Been an honour. Thanks, guys.